Good morning, afternoon, evening. Welcome back to another edition of the Best DFS Show that just happens to start at 8 Eastern Standard Time. My name is Rob Diamond, Rad Rob Diamond on Twitter, Sir Robert Six and all the main sites. Welcome back. It was a nice little break. I shouldn't say nice. It wasn't very nice at all. It was a tough break without any videos, but I'm back now. I got my internet connection sorted, and I'm back using a different recording program. So it took some time to get the learning curve out of the way, but now that I got that settled, uh, we're right back into the uh, the videos here. The uh, Rota Pro's Best DFS FS show right, right back at you. So let's get started right away here today. I don't want to waste too much time because it is always Champions League. Most importantly, today is the final Champions League day. It is match day six, uh, which means that after the games this week, um, basically the group stages are over and we move on to the knockout round, which is uh, really exciting, jam-packed full of some of the most amazing games uh, possible throughout the entire season. So I'm um, really looking forward to that. But uh, first thing first, we got to match day six to get out of the way uh so let's just jump right into that as always <clears throat> excuse me i got the screen share going right away and i have uh, a nice little picture of myself going the entire time so you can see exactly how i'm talking uh because who doesn't want to see more of my face and my hand talking so uh yeah let, let's jump right into this right away um so uh, obviously uh we have uh the, the slate here in DraftKings. uh first i'm going to actually um do this and we're going to go over the schedule first so yeah, um, for today, uh, we're dealing uh, with groups A to D, uh, both uh, of Group D uh, scheduled games are outside the main slate. They're both in the morning. Uh, I'll talk with them on my article, which I should have out this morning as well. If you jump over to rotopros.com, hit the article tabs at the top, scroll down to soccer, uh, click on that. They all should be free. You should be able to see it right there. It'll be up sometime today before, probably uh, uh, noonish. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, getting everything settled here. Uh, we don't really have to worry about Galatasaray or Porto and Chalak and uh, Moscow because they're not on the main slate. So uh, generally speaking, let's just jump right in here. And uh, what we have today is, uh, let's just jump right to the table actually. It's usually easier to do it this way. So we have uh, Atletico and Dortmund both taking trips to uh, Club Bruges and Monaco respectively. Uh, then in Group B, we have uh, the big game of the day. It's Barcelona and Spurs. Uh obviously and then the uh, other game in that group is uh, Inter Milan and PSV uh, group C this is going to be the real deal. This is going to be the main game here for today, that or main game, main group that everyone's going to be watching for today. It's Napoli, uh, PSG, Liverpool, and Red Star. Uh, this is still totally up in the air. And like I said, Group D is all uh, outside the main slate, so we don't really have to worry about that, especially since it's uh, already set up. Uh, basically, it's sorted. So we don't even have to worry about who's going to finish what, uh, which leads to what I want to talk about first. This Champions League this season is one of the first in a really long time that haven't produced any major surprises. Uh, if you go across the entire, uh, really every group, there's not really a surprise. These two are expected to go through. Uh, Tottenham is a little bit of a surprise today, but as I'll, I'll get there, it'll really surprise me if they actually make it through. Uh, and uh, uh, so exactly, like I was saying, Inter, those three were always in question. It was always these three in question. And uh, Porto and Chalak uh, were, or I keep saying Chalak, I'm sorry, Schalke, Schalke. Porto and Schalke uh, both uh, were the favors to come through here. Though I did have some love for Galatasaray, it just didn't work out for them. Uh, so basically, the reason I'm pointing this out is because you'll notice the group that is already sorted is not on the final day main slate. And that's because this is literally the way the schedule was set up to turn out so that the final day would literally work out this way. Uh, now, like I was saying, seasons where there's surprises and things like that, this always doesn't work out uh, exactly as the schedule is planned. But that is the way we're faced with this today. It's a very predictable schedule. So um, really, again, I'm not expecting too many surprises here. Uh, outside of the uh, Group C and Group B question marks, everything else is really really clear cut for today. So, uh, yeah, uh, really quickly, we're looking at group a Dortmund and Atletico don't necessarily need to win their games today, which has got me slightly down on them just a little bit. Uh, but in terms of 
if I was to pick either Atletico or Dortmund, I'd definitely take Dortmund like eight times out of ten. Atletico are a defensive my team, and really uh, out, outside of Champions League, they've only scored more than a few goals a couple times this season, and both those games were against like ridiculously, obscenely bad competition. So Atletico just don't score a lot of goals. They don't take a lot of shots. So if you do concede, chances are they're providing you with the exact same amount of shots or saves as they're going to score, which means you're basically just finishing at zero anyways. And on top of that, they have an incredible defense. So there's just not a lot of reason to go uh, with uh, Atletico uh, because they are just not, they're, they're an incredible world-class side. They're just not really DFS relevant every single slate. And as we get into the players and we break it down, I'll explain that further. Uh, but in terms of this slate, I'm really not liking Atletico very much, even though they're, they're, they're one, they're, they're going to win. Uh, they're one of the bigger favors to win, no doubt. And I have no question that they will win. It's only a matter of how will that win translate to DFS. And I don't think it will very well this slate. Uh, now, on the other hand, Dortmund just by default will be better options uh, than Atletico. But at the same time, they don't really need to win. And if Atletico isn't winning and Dortmund's barely winning, uh, that's all they're going to need. They'll just need a win. Uh, so I think because Dortmund... Is Dortmund's basically forced to accept the fact this is out of their control. Uh, so they're not going to be going in here like some other teams we're going to be talking about who have to win. Uh, so I don't expect them to go looking for the win and to go out of their mind. And because there are going to be some slate-breaking performances this slate, I, I just don't see it coming from Group A, mostly because nobody needs to. Very simply, nobody needs to go out and break the slate, so they probably won't. Where in basically every other group here, we have someone who has to break the slate in order for their team to progress. Uh, so yeah, that's just why I'm not really too interested in Group A today. If you end up fading all of them, uh, don't be too concerned about it. There's obviously options we'll get to, but yeah. Uh, and to, Group B is really where you want to be focusing a lot along with Group C, but Basically, Barcelona's through. Everyone knows that. Uh, the battle right now is between Spurs and Inter Milan. So very simply put, Spurs need to win. If they do not win, they will not progress. Inter has them on every tiebreaker possible. So unless... Um, Unless Spurs, their like minimum hope that they can go for is drawing Barcelona and hoping Inter Milan lose. Uh, that's really all they can shoot for is like the first reachable result. Uh, but basically speaking, Inter Milan are going to beat PSV. Uh, it's not going to be as close, or it's not going to be a blowout. It's going to be extremely close. Both sides are going to be involved. But mm, the key is here is that Spurs have to win. Uh, it's next to impossible, but they literally have to win. And when it comes down to game, the, the match day six, and you take a team like Spurs, this isn't a Club Bruges or a Monaco or a Red Star or something like that where it's a team where you have to wonder if they're going to be able to be up for it. They still do have Harry Kane. They still do have Erickson. They still do have uh, Hugo Lloris, who just won the World Cup. So like, it's not like they're completely inept and can't win a game. That's all they have to do, just win a game. That's all it comes down to right now. It's not a series. It's not a whole group stage. They just need one game in Spain that they have to win. And though all the odds are stacked against them, they have more than enough to go and do that. Uh, I don't think they will, but uh, they definitely have the ability to do so. Um, and yeah, like I was saying, Inter should be PSV. Uh, I don't think that'll be too complicated. It shouldn't be too much of a surprise. Uh, this will be the big game right here. Now, unlike Group A, uh, this is our first experience or exposure with what I'm calling halftime teams. Now, what this specifically means for this slate is there's a bunch of teams that are going to be going in at halftime looking at the score. They're not even going to be considering their own game. They're first looking at the score, and then they're going to consider how to approach their own game. Um, if Inter Milan are not winning, I should say, if Ermland are losing and in any way handily and doesn't look like they're going to win the game, um, I'll be very surprised if uh, Spurs, like, go crazy ham. They'll probably shoot for a draw. And, like, I don't expect Barcelona to equally go out and go absolutely obscenely crazy here this late. Uh, I think Messi's an incredible option because he's Messi and he's playing literally uh, in some of his best football of his entire career, which is mind-blowing when you think about it. The... Uh, the Spurs situation, they just need to draw at that point. Uh, but 
needless to say, I think uh, it, it should go without saying Inter Milan uh, will either be drawing or winning at halftime. I don't think they'll be losing, and I don't really think they'll be winning, to be honest. It would surprise me if it was a 1-1 draw between Inter Milan and PSV at halftime, and Spurs go in here knowing they have to win. And what this creates is a second-half team where they're going to completely change their entire game plan to go out in the second half and win games. And while this is the first instance of it today... Um, Basically speaking, as we get closer to the end of the game, and if they're not winning, they're playing with no defenders. They're literally throwing everyone forward. Their season rides in this game. These games, in particular this one, but these games we'll be discussing like this, 5 nothing, one nothing, exact same type of loss. They do not care. This is DFS heaven because what ends up happening is if Spurs are losing one nothing at halftime and they go into the dressing room seeing that they need to win... They're taking literally every chance possible against Barcelona. And it doesn't take a soccer genius to realize you start taking runs at Barcelona and they're going to make you pay badly. And while Spurs may have enough to to make this interesting, I just think Barcelona are too good. Uh, but that's really this group's breakdown. Um, Spurs need to win, and that's what the entire day rests on. And if Spurs doesn't win, they're going to the uh, Europa League. I, I should have mentioned that before I started breaking down the schedules. Basically, the way this works now is after today's games, the first and second team from each group advance, and the third place team from each group goes to the Europa League. Now, if you're unfamiliar with what the Europa League is, that's the league that is like the Champions League, but for the third and fourth place teams instead of the first and second place teams. So you'll see a lot of the uh, the lower teams in the Europas. For example, this year, um, Burnley was actually in the Europas uh, because they finished uh, so highly last season. So a lot of times in the English Premier League, you'll hear uh, hear the discussion about European football next season. And a lot of that has to do with qualifying in the top part of your league so you qualify for Europe, uh, whether that be Champions League or the Europa League. So like I was saying, the top two teams from each group advance uh, to next round and the third place team goes to Europa. So Club Bruges already knows they're Europa bound next season. Doesn't matter what happens. Monaco could win. They're not catching Club Bruges. Uh, the third place team still is up in the air here. So whenever we think about the Europa League coming up, we know that they're going to have a juggernaut here in either Spurs or Inter Milan dropping in. Uh, so that's something to consider later. But in reality, we're looking at the top two teams here for today. And... Uh, like I said, I think it's going to be Barcelona and Inter. I really do believe that, but uh, we'll wait and see what happens here. Um, in Group C, now this is this was the hyped group, and it's completely lived up. So basically, this is how today works. There's three main scenarios that are going to come from this group today. Um, either the first scenario is obviously PSG and Red Star, and PSG need to win. Um, now that's not entirely fair. They need to tie at least, uh, but if they lose, uh, they could be in serious trouble. So while they don't have to win, they, they can't lose. That's the big thing for PSG. So, um, they may get out to a two, three, nothing and just cruise and chill out. And that's a concern for me. Uh, but at the same time, they're at Red Star and while Red Star has done some good things, I'll talk about that when we get to the players, I think this is week. This week's a little bit different, and there's a lot more different implications than we saw in previous weeks when Liverpool and Napoli traveled to Serbia. So, uh, I do think PSG is more than good enough to get the win this slate, which means both Napoli and Liverpool are going to be forced to duel it out here for the last qualification spot. So, basically, Liverpool has Napoli beat on all the tiebreakers. So, all Liverpool has to do is win and they're guaranteed to go through but they're not guaranteed which place they'll be going through now i talk about this a little bit in my article today so if you're a little bit more curious and want to see the breakdown by all means jump over there but the tiebreakers run crazy crazy deep and i'm going to see if i can do this off the top of my head it goes uh record between the two goal differential between the two meaning whenever they play each other sorry um and then it goes Record goal differential, uh, total. I think it's oh, I can't remember if it's total goals four or away goals is first. I think it's total goals is first, and between the two, 
So whichever team just scored the most goals between the two whenever they played. And then the next tiebreaker after that is called the away goal rule. And this is actually where most tiebreakers end. Uh, Generally speaking, when you discuss a tie, uh, the first group is usually tied because everything was a tie that led to this tie. So uh, this is usually where tiebreakers are made and uh, broken, I should say. And it's called the away goal rule. And basically, when the two teams played each other which away team scored more goals and this is incredibly valuable and you you may have even heard many commentators talking about this throughout the champions league about the away goal being more valuable uh so that that's what they're referencing is that away goals are more valuable than home goals because a lot of times when ties happen that's the range that the tie gets broken because a lot of the range ahead of that is what causes the tie in the first place so it's just something to uh, think about because what could happen today is PSG ties, Liverpool wins, and Napoli loses, which creates a three-way tie, which gets absolutely bonkers. Uh, and then, then things get completely thrown out the window, and it it goes through all of those that I mentioned, and then it, if it's still tied after all of that, it the tiebreaker restarts, but it considers every single game they played in the Champions League uh, instead of against each other. And then it goes through that whole thing again. And then if it's still tied, which is really unlikely, uh, what actually ends up happening is uh, they just take the higher ranked club and they have like a scoring system for like how many times they've appeared in Champions League or Europa. And the, the higher ranking club gets sent through. Now, I think the furthest this has ever gone was uh, total cards. Uh, which is two steps above the final tiebreaker of the higher ranking team. Uh, And what that basically is, is that all yellow and red cards are awarded a score, and the team with the lowest score progresses. Uh, So basically, whoever took the least amount of cards uh, ends up progressing. And that's that. to get to that point, it's pretty crazy. So uh, yeah, uh, that's just the tiebreaker we're looking at for today. it's tough to say PSG are just going to win because nobody else has at Red Star yet. Uh, but in terms of Liverpool and Napoli, I do think Liverpool has what it takes to find the win today. Which is kind of scary because what we may actually see is a team go from literally leading basically the entire tournament to being eliminated on the final day. And that's one thing when it's it happens. It's another when it's a world-class team like Napoli. So that's something to consider here today. That's what I think is going to happen. But those are really the, the main three things that's going to happen. Um, if PSG does not win... Uh, they're in serious trouble uh, because all Liverpool has to do is win. Uh, but Liverpool can't draw. That's the the big thing here. And this is why I like Liverpool more than Spurs is because Spurs uh, is not only playing Barcelona, but uh, Liverpool uh, is at home uh, playing a team that they've already done well against. Uh, mind you, too, they have an away goal on Napoli. So, yeah. Um, I just want to say that it's going to be Liverpool and PSG going through. It really wouldn't surprise me, though, if it ended up being Napoli and Liverpool that make it through. And this group is so weird. There's going to be some, There's going to be a GPP play here today that's just going to blow everyone away. Whether it's going to be Red Star come out and find a result against PSG or uh, Liverpool knock Napoli completely out of the tournament. And while that may not strike as a massive GPP, uh, just in terms of standings, it really is. So... Yeah, uh, that is the schedule breakdown for today. I hope that gives everyone an idea of the situation. Uh, like I said, it's uh, it's basically sudden death at this point. Uh, it, it, everything ends after today. So yeah, let's uh, let's break right into the slate, and we'll start right away with Spurs at Barcelona. So the the big point here is that. Uh, Spurs are up against it. I know this is one game, but like Barcelona are, are almost untouchable at home in Europe and even more so against English teams. Uh, they've beaten Spurs three straight games. They have lost only once in their previous nine at home versus English sides. Uh, they haven't, I think they've, they're undefeated in uh, something like, or what was it? They've only lost once in 28 previous Champions League home games. Like, it's just stupid, stupid statistics. And when you think about Champions League is one thing, uh, but this is a, the final day is really big. And in the last uh, four or five Champions League, Barcelona have won their final game. Uh, and 
interestingly enough, Spurs has never lost a match day six game before. This is a really crazy game. Like in terms of history, uh, relevance, implications, it's just an insane game. So um, I do think that Messi's a must play this slate, especially for cash. Um, I probably prefer him in the midfield range, uh, but it, it, it's completely up to you really where you put him. Um, he's just playing incredible, incredible quality of footy. Uh, he scored two goals in the weekend, both free kicks. Uh, you, you don't need to really read too deep into this. The question generally is that, is Messi playing well? Yes or no? He's not really playing well. You can probably fade him. If he's playing well, yeah, jump right in there. And uh, this slate, I have absolutely no problem with him. Uh, even against Spurs, I may not look for it in GPP just uh, due to ownership and a total, like, general lack of ceiling uh in the case that spurs do keep this close or spurs end up finding a result uh however surprising that may be um because at the end of the day, Barcelona don't need to win. Uh, they may just go out and flunk this because they, they can. Uh, so, yeah, that that's something to consider. Uh, I, I should have also mentioned earlier, too, again, sorry to go back. Um, when, after the games today, and we're into the knockout stages, basically what happens is that all the first place teams are given a seed uh, throughout the group. So, uh I should bring up the Wikipedia page for it, uh, and it'll show it. If you if you just search Wikipedia, it'll give you a really good uh, bunch of different graphs showing you exactly how this works. But basically, all the first place teams get seeded, and all the second place teams get put into a hat, basically, and get drawn into uh, playing the first seeded team. So if you finish first, you know you're not going to play another first place team. It's just not happening. So. When we look at the, again, it'll be more, more uh, what's the word I'm thinking of, more useful tomorrow to look at this. And we'll be able to see that Juventus, Real Madrid, Manchester United, Manchester City, Barcelona, uh, e Atletico or Dortmund. These are all the first place teams. And you don't want to play these teams. Like, it basically finishing first means uh, you have like a 60% chance of getting a team that you can beat. And if you finish second, it basically means you have like a 10 to 20% chance of getting a team you can beat. So it's like a massive difference. And Barcelona's finishing first. This is salted. They don't need anything from this game other than just to do Barcelona things. So, yeah, Messi is a borderline must play. And you can always get it away with a pivot down to Coutinho if you want. Uh, there's been nothing wrong with his play. Uh, and in GPP, this is probably where I would do my looking um, just because... Uh, ownership and salary and while like he doesn't have the same kind of floor uh, you're not going to lose with a, a ceiling like this it doesn't matter who you play uh, if you're scoring this many points in any slate and as long as the slate isn't going like the craziest slate in the history of slates you're going to be absolutely fine uh, so yeah that's just something to consider there uh, but in terms of yeah, I like Coutinho for GPP. I like even uh, a, a Barcelona defensive uh, kind of attempt here because over those massive amount of games, uh, they they barely concede. They've only let like 13 Champions League goals in uh, in their past 28 games. So yeah, um, home games I should say. Excuse me, 13 home goals allowed in their past 13 games. So like, I don't even mind uh, a defensive chase though it hasn't been good this season. Uh, it's just there. There's going to be a ceiling. You know Spurs are going to shoot and they're going to be going for it. So the ceiling's there. The floor, nah, not interested, but ceiling absolutely is totally there for the taking. And like I said, uh, the messy, messy cash continue GPP is probably where I would go if I'm looking at Barcelona. I'm probably just going to look at Messi all the time anyways for cash. But uh, if I'm looking at Barcelona, GPP is definitely Coutinho. And dropping in on Spurs, it sounds like Trippier is going to be out. And this is actually a, a massive deal for them because, God bless them, Serge Aurier is not going to be able to deal with Philippe Coutinho. Uh, he didn't when he played in the, champ, or champ, in the English Premier League against each other, and it definitely won't happen now, uh, So especially at Barcelona. Uh, that kind of just drives home the notion that uh, attacking that uh, left-hand side, this slate on uh, Spurs, could be really, really useful. And that's why I like uh, Coutinho and GPP. Uh, but, uh, yeah, 
Christian Eriksen is double digits. Like, it, there's no denying that. Uh, so, again, it's like it's not like we're paying 10K for the double digits. Uh, against Barcelona, see, he didn't play against Barcelona last time, so he can't, like, specifically say, don't worry, he's done this already. Like, he, <laughs> we don't know how they're going to play at Barcelona. And, like, I don't mind Dembele, you know. Like, again, like, I, I think there's sides to this game. It's just... A matter of figuring out which one you want to be on and like ugh, he's gonna have so much ownership um his salary is still too much for me at 9.1k um and i if this was at if this was at home it'd be a different situation which is a weird thing to say but basically this champions league Spurs have only gotten one point away from their uh, one point from their away games, uh, and usually they're struggling at home, which has been the case this Champions League. So yeah, I'm just not like gung ho on Spurs away from home, especially when it's against Barcelona. It's just like there's so many reasons not to do that. Uh, but yeah, um, in terms of a take and a score, I'm gonna say three one Barcelona. Um, I think it's going to be 1-1 at at half or right after half but Spurs know that Inter is winning and so Spurs know they have to win and they're going to start taking chances Barcelona is going to slowly capitalize on two of those chances but they're not going to push things and they're just going to after two or three goals Barcelona are going to sit back and just let things kind of come to them and so that's why like I like Barcelona because they're Barcelona they're at home they're dominant and they have every bit of history on their side but um, they just don't need to go go crazy ham, kind of like the Dortmund Atletico thing. They just don't need to. So, um, messy cash, continue GPP, and if uh, you want to be really risky in GPP, uh, chase some of that uh, that Barcelona defensive uh, clean sheet clean sheet chase. And uh, if you're gonna go Spurs, uh, uh, Harry Kane GPP. Um, and if I, if I was to do anything, it would probably be Erickson. I want to say Erickson cash, but like, again, it's two, maybe an Erickson Kane GPP stack, but like try and tell me that's not going to be highly owned with every homer in England and North America who loves these teams are going to pick this simply because it's going against Barcelona, going against the biggest name in the slate and Messi. So like, I just see the contrarian value of Spurs completely slip away because they're still going to be super owned. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm going to say Barcelona 3-1, uh, Messi with two goals and an assist, Coutinho with the goal and the assist. Uh, I do like Barcelona to be very condensed today. I do like whoever does do their attacking to be ripping through them. I don't see this being spread out and like him getting some and him getting some. It's going to be bam, Coutinho, bam, Messi, and uh, they're going to be at it. Uh, I'm going to say a 3-1 Barcelona win. Next game, we have PSV taking on uh, Inter Milan. Now, this is a crazy game. <laughs> this is legitimately uh, one of the craziest games of the slate, mostly because it's going to have no ownership at all. Uh, I, I don't know how people will be able to own Liverpool or Napoli or PS or and PSG and Atletico and Dortmund and Barcelona or Messi and Spurs. And then they're going to take a look at PSV and Inter because the names just don't match up uh, homer wise or like pro prolifically. Uh, so I, across the board, this game is absolutely jam packed with, with value, with points, with production, everything. So I'm just going to rip through it position wise, both teams. I'm not going to choose between a team. I think this is going to be 3 2 Inter Milan victory. I think it's going to be the high scoring. Okay, 3 2 Inter Milan victory. I think it's going to be the high scoring game of the slate. I think both teams starting forwards are going to score a goal. Um, just go ham. Uh, but let's start with the goaltenders. I'm not interested in Handovic because he's just way too expensive. Would it surprise me if he gets a clean sheet? Absolutely not. Would it surprise me if he gets more than three saves? Yes. It would. It would surprise me very much. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to be going uh, on the Jerome Zoet side of things. People can say whatever they want about PSV. The fact is, is that they've kept every score really, really close outside their first shellacking at Barcelona. Uh, like, they only lost Inter 2-1. Uh, they drew 
they drew Spurs 2-2 and then only lost them 2-1. Uh, and literally like the most grossest, sickest comeback in the history of time. And they still managed to score in Barcelona and uh, almost beat them, which kind of drives home the point here that I was just talking about. Barcelona aren't going to go out and like slam a ceiling of six goals. If they were, it would have happened already. Uh, this should be indicative of the fact that they don't or they don't, they won't go out and like find a true ceiling. So that's Barcelona, sorry. That isn't this game. That's just touching back in Barcelona. Uh, so yeah, <clears throat> Inter is going to give Zoet every opportunity to make five saves. Um, and he's done it time and time again. So uh, even when he got blown out for four goals, he still made five saves, which means nine shots on net, which means a couple of things. One, PSV are allowing a lot of shots on net until he's capable of saving them. And uh, it just so happens, Inter is a crazy shooting team. So, yeah, we'll get there. I think, uh, again, like, see, Inter can go out here and get up like one or two nothing, and they're fine. <clears throat> Excuse me, because they have Spurs beaten on tiebreakers. So, um, they're totally set here to just go on cruise control and, um, not have to worry too deeply about uh, actually making a huge splash. Now, will they? I think they will. Uh, but uh, it, that's that. We'll explain that shortly here. But yeah, I think Zoet's a great play if you're looking for that value keeper in cash. I wouldn't take in GPP. Uh, you you can if you really think Spurs have the potential to find a way to get through this, then yes, by all means, take some Zoet and just kind of go with that script that Inter aren't going to do well. Uh, because Inter can still progress with a 2-1 win or a 2 nothing win. Uh, so yeah, I, I see that being a very viable chase. I don't really like too much of the backs here. It'll be interesting to see if Versacolo gets going again. Uh, he only started that last game against Barcelona, but you can see his uh, his purpose and his value. Uh, so uh, that'll be interesting to see, um, especially with his uh, 5K salary. Uh, it's accessible. Um, I'm not really interested in the inter defense because I think, like I said, PSV will score, uh, completely ruining the clean sheet. There's not a lot to look at here, uh, from the midfield options on either team. Uh, a lot of that has to do with like Parasic literally hasn't scored in years. Uh, and like I got nothing but respect for the guy and he's an incredible player. Uh, really talented was in the world cup this summer, did really well, but like, uh, he just has not scored at all. So uh, I'm just not going to chase that in either format. Uh, there's no point. Uh, this is where you want to look this slate. Wow. Um, basically, any... Oh, no, not that three. Um, any of these three, uh, and you're absolutely set. Uh I would probably keep Acardi to GPP uh, just because he's shown a couple times this season that his floor is concerning. But he's second only behind Dzeko in terms of uh, scoring chances uh, this Champions League. So he's getting lots of chances. He's getting shots on net. He's just not converting them at a rate that would drive up his salary to be comparable to the other 9K, 10K plays which really aren't that much of a difference in their ceilings. Um, they really aren't because like um, Inter with a 2 nothing win, both goals falling on Icardi from 8.5K is the equivalent of Messi uh, just helping you scoop in cash. Like there's no difference there. Icardi's ownership, salary, production output, it's all there just waiting. Uh, he's consistent. Um, I'm not crazy about the floor. I wish I was. I wish I could say... Take that home favorite uh, forward that's playing 90 minutes and shoots the ball a lot. I want to say that's a viable play because meta standards it is, but it's just not something I'm queuing on for cash this late, mostly because there's such incredible plays in guys like Messi. Uh, so, in the other hand, though, we have uh, Lazao uh, for just a few hundred less. <clears throat> This is someone that you can take in cash. Now, that you don't have to worry about uh, whether or not uh, he's going to get a goal, uh, which has only happened the once. 
Uh, he's been clocking double digits. I'm not incredibly like writing home jumped at the chance of 8.2K for double digits. I think there's some cheaper guys you could go with, in particular uh, Politano. Uh, I'm not incredibly excited about his minutes, uh, but he does stand a really good chance to get to uh, double digits for under 8K, which uh, I think is incredibly valuable. Uh, so, yeah, it... The forwards here, though, De Jong as well. Uh, don't do, don't not sleep on Luke De Jong. Uh, do not sleep on Luke De Jong. He is legitimate. He's the team captain. He's like six foot five, two hundred and twenty pounds. He's a forward. Uh, as you can see, he's more than capable. Headers, headers, headers. Like the guy likes to score goals from assists. So not only is he good for a goal, but he's going to get an assist from the goal too. So yeah, I, uh, I think there's lots of options to be had on either side of this game. Uh, but probably, <clears throat> excuse me, my favorite thing about PSV and why I, I'm rather, I like them a little bit more than I probably should is because their minutes are so awesome. They don't sub. And when they do sub it's for people that are not in big positions. Uh, so like Lazano is not coming up, knock on wood, He's not coming off the field. Uh, like, uh, definitely shouldn't. Uh, hasn't shown the slightest hint of doing so. Uh, De Jong has come off the field, but he's done so during times that, like, he was already well sorted and salted as from 5K to over three times salary. So, yeah, he was absolutely fine at that point. And, like, that's the thing with De Jong. He may come off, but it's going to be at a, a point in the game where you're, you're already going to be fine. If he doesn't do it by that point, he's not going to do it. And if he's coming off and he's done it, he, he would have already done it. So, yeah, that's uh, really my take for the PSV Inter game. Um, I, I'm i going to say 2-2 two, two draw, 3-2 Inter win. Now, to be clear, um, Inter, if Inter at halftime go in and see that Spurs are getting like slammed, they know they don't even have to win. So that's kind of a concern. Uh, a lot of this, again, this is a halftime team. A lot of this depends on Spurs not getting the crap kicked out of the, by Barcelona. If that occurs, then you can probably chase uh, some uh, some uh, Inter Milan ceilings because they're, they're going to have to win. They can't risk it at that point. They can't leave it up to Spurs. Uh, but if Spurs are uh, losing uh, in any way handily, Inter know that they can just cruise control and they're going to be absolutely fine. So I think at halftime it's going to be close between Spurs and Barcelona. Uh, like I said, I, I, I think I touched on it just a few minutes ago. I think um, Spurs and Barcelona are going to be close at halftime, but Inter will be either tying or winning at halftime forcing Spurs to go out and really go for it. And at the same time, Inter's going to look across and see the Spurs are keeping it close and know that they're only at 2-1, and so they're really going to have to keep pushing it as well. Uh, and so that's why I like Inter and Spurs so much uh, from this group. Uh, and obviously, I really like PSV uh, as well. And like, yeah, I can't go wrong. You can't go wrong, really, anywhere here. Um other than the parts I told you were wrong. I guess you were wrong there. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I really like uh, the 3-2 scoreline here for Inter. I think that's being a little bit ceiling. Ce ceiling. Lee ceiling. I'm chasing a lot of ceiling in this game. And that is a little bit concerning. Considering neither of them are very talented. In terms of Barcelona, Real Madrid. Da, 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 these big names. And uh, neither of these teams have necessarily shown the kind of ceiling uh, yet this tournament. Uh, in particular, these two who have kept every game uh, just within shooting distance of each other. Uh, so yeah, um, one, 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 one goal game. Let's say that for sure this is going to be a one goal game. Maybe two tops. 2-1, two, 3-2, Inter Milan. Next game, Atletico traveling to Bruges. Uh, now, this is the first of two games this late where you're going to have to, I won't say what I want to say, which is kind of a dirty word. You're going to have to draw a line in the sand and pick a side and say, 
I'm going with Atletico and I'm going to lose my money, or I'm not going to go with Atletico and I'm going to win lots of money. Uh, that's really your two sides here. Um, obviously, I, I just told you what I think is going to happen, but this is the deal with Atletico. Um, basically, outside of Champions League this season, you'll see these two games. Uh, this was like literally not even exaggeration. Uh, this 4 nothing victory was their largest victory of the season. Like, it's not even remotely close. They did beat someone else 4 nothing, but it was like a team that was so down far low in the uh, the cup uh, there. In the, it was a cup tie, and it's so far down low in the Spanish leagues that they didn't even have a logo that pops up on Google when you search them in Google. Like, they're a local-list team. So... Like, Atletico scoring four goals is the equivalent of Barcelona scoring eight goals. I'm not even exaggerating. Like, this team just does not score goals unless they fall on them. And you'll notice the week before that against Bruges, they fell on it because Griezmann had two penalty shot goals. Much like Man United, who we'll talk about tomorrow, who fell on their three goals against Young Boys for the first time all season, scoring three goals. Because Paul Pogba had two penalty shots. So, um, this is just something to remember. Uh, like, here's... Yeah, I'll just level it out for you. Like, there's just no way in hell Griezmann at 10.2K is going to beat Salah. Is going to beat Mbappe against Red Star. Who we'll talk about in a bit. Who should absolutely shred this slate to, like, absolute smithereens. Harry Kane, who we already talked about. Um, Accardi, who we talked about. Uh, Lozano, Lozano at 8.2k has more ceiling than Griezmann and has just as much floor as Griezmann. Now, don't get me wrong, Griezmann has more of a role than Lozano does, but Griezmann does his role like at a quarter of uh, not uh, not efficiency. They're both very efficient. It occurs literally at a at a quarter of a rate that um, the opportunity for Lozano and PSV to find his ceiling occurs. So Griezmann is never a bad player. That isn't the argument here. The argument is that Griezmann is not a good play. At 10.8K, when you have literally all these other options across the board, not even talking the strictly midfield players like Coutinho and Eriksen and even someone like Pulisic or Koke. Koke even makes more sense than Griezmann because he's going to draw basically the same kind of floor, the same kind of considered or implied upside considering they're playing such a crappy team. Uh, and at the same time, literally save like 3K in salary. Like 3K! 3k that's that's a lot of money that's like the difference between playing Coutinho Lazao and playing Messi and Neymar like massive differences in salary uh, <coughs> excuse me so maybe that's 6k I wasn't very good at math so don't don't quote me on that but uh yeah in terms of there's just like no reason to play Atletico as a team, they don't really go for a ceiling unless like it's a GPP script. And the only time you really want to play Griezmann or Koke is in cash because that's really what they do is they take a gazillion crosses and don't convert on any more than like one or two tops. Uh, so yeah, you can, again, like that's 18 points right there. And so that means you're basically just barely making floor from 12.5k you're not even making floor from 12.k that's like 0.5 value uh without his goal and assist uh and like again like that's 12 so you're looking at six fantasy points which is what you're looking for from a floor play but from 10.5k like you have to it's this is fine if it's 9 or 8k but when it starts getting up to the tens you have to consider what are they really going to do in comparison to the rest of the slate and i'm sorry he's not going to beat neymar or messi and he's like salah at home after scoring a hat trick under 10k okay <laughs> like you're going to take Griezmann over that I would even yeah like I don't know Mbappe I'll talk about him now he he's gotten 12 goals so far this Champions League eight of them have come away from home that it's like the most obscene scoring rate away from home this season no one's even remotely close to him so 
if you want someone away from home who you know is going to score a goal, Mbappe at 10.3K, and you don't even have to worry about Harry Kane and his penalty shots, which is really his main out. Uh, if Harry Kane doesn't get two penalty shots, he's not going to be doing very much. But, yeah, uh, that's just my Atletico take. I'm sorry it was drony and borderline pointless, but that's just the facts of the matter. Atletico are an incredible team, world class. They're going to be able to go out and do things. They're probably going to win. They're probably even going to get a clean sheet because they have one of the better clean sheet chasers in the entire world with Oblak and the crossing wing backs. Now, uh, it'll be interesting to see who they start with their injuries. Uh, but uh, yeah, you're really pushing with Bruges. Um, they can score a goal. See, part of this is like the sharp play would be suggesting, well, if Atletico aren't going to score very much, uh, then they should be in a low-scoring game, which would give credence to the opposition keeper. The problem with that is Atletico very simply don't shoot the ball enough to really offset anything that may occur. So a lot of times what happens is they... I could run through basically every keeper they've played this this Champions League, and this is the exact same number every single time. Whatever the goals allowed were, that's generally the amount of saves they're providing, which generally means zero. So, like, it isn't a value play just because Atletico don't put out that kind of ceiling, which would warrant uh, warrant the uh, the uh, the upside that would come from someone like uh, like we talked about last game on PSV with Zoet. Uh, like has all the floor uh, that you could possibly need, and Hovarth and Lefka have neither. Uh, and no real defensive options, especially without the clean sheet. There are midfield options here, though. You definitely have to consider. Uh, see, it's it's tough again because you're either having to go against the tide, which is that Atletico Madrid are one of the best defensive teams in the entire world, bar none. Or they've been really bad this Champions League. They've conceded at a disturbing rate, which gives credence to every other team. And Rudd Vormer, in that script, in that second script, is borderline a cash lock from 4.4K. Uh, he's got all the floor you need. He uh, takes set pieces for them. Uh, he's even found a ceiling. So, like, in the case you're worried that there's no upside, there is. Uh, so, I'll talk about Monaco here in a second. This should give you an idea how bad bad they are um and why they need to be targeted so ferociously uh that's just the the situation here with atletico uh if you think they're defensive just fade uh fade the bruise and jump on the atletico defensive side if you think the defense is going to falter uh take uh some vormer and cash and some vanak and gpp even, uh, I'm not even going to try and pretend to know how to pronounce his last name, so I'm just going to wing it. Dan Dandra Groenvold. Not bad. Um, he's been excellent uh, and also comes in as a midfield forward option. So if you're in any way thinking that Atletico won't hold this clean sheet, which is fairly GPP kind of scripty, um you can you really can get away with some Bruges players. They're, they're definitely not where I would look first, uh, but you can absolutely get away with it this way because from these salaries, you only need a goal. Where going back over here again to Griezmann from 10.2k on top of comparing all the other names that are in the salary range, you really need Griezmann to have a good game. Like and not just like a, oh he did okay. You need a good game to cash. And if you do not get a good game from Griezmann, you have no hope whatsoever. Uh, and so that's just not what I'm looking to target and cash. Uh, that good, There's going to be lots of good games. Lozano's going to have a good game. Uh, Messi's going to have a good game. Uh, if Griezmann doesn't, you're in trouble. So, yeah. Um, score. Probably 2 nothing Atletico. Maybe 2-1 if Bruges can score one. Uh, that's really the question. Can Atletico get it done for you in DFS with only two goals from that salary? And if you can confidently answer yes, Griezmann up. He's not a, he's not a bad player. It, that isn't the question. The question is whether or not he'll be a good DFS play 
Rad Rob says no. I say no. That's my take. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll say two nothing despite Griezmann getting a goal. Uh, and yeah, you could probably get away with the double ups. I wouldn't do it in heads up uh, or GPP for sure, not in GPP. Uh, so let's say let's say two nothing, two one Atletico. Next game we have Dortmund uh, taking on Monaco. Um, check this out. You want to see a team that like defines the definition of everything bad and wrong with the team right now it is monaco uh the one good thing they have going for them is thierry Henry is their manager <laughs> and that's literally like the only hope they have right now um yeah <laughs> i i don't have to say anything i just if you're okay let me say if you are listening to this video and you're at work or something with headphones and you have the screen down and uh, you are trying to look busy. What I'm currently pointing at is Monaco's keeper, Benjalio, uh, with a 0, minus 4, 2, and minus 2 fantasy point scorings. Um, mind you, against Dortmund and Atletico twice isn't really the best times, but... Uh, negative four against uh, Club Rouge should speak volumes. Uh, but this just gets ugly. Like, close your eyes. If you do not like the injury bug, close your eyes. Because this is going to get really ugly. Starting wing back. Starting wing back. Starter. Best player. Only hope they have to do anything, period, whatsoever. Second best player that they have any hope, period, to do anything, ever. Third best player that they have any hope, period, to do anything ever, and their set pieces taker. I already talked about. Oh no, that's the other Troy that's out. Uh, there's two different Troy's that's out, uh, and he's incredibly skilled as well. Uh, just hasn't caught it in a, the GPP sense. Um, Thielmans is interesting in the sense that he's basically all they have, and he's probably going to take their set pieces. But they are Monaco are so so bad that like. It's almost not even worth looking at. Um, and again, it's like... You may not have, not have heard of Stefan Djokovic uh, because he hasn't played yet. But uh, I think it's Montenegro he's from. He's incredible. He's a really, really good forward. He just hasn't got any playing time due to injuries, which has kind of been his running theme, unfortunately, throughout his career. He's been injured a lot. But, like, uh, Grandisir, I was kind of looking forward to him as a sneaky play. And, like... Celia was replacing Falcao. Falcao is like 45. I'm not joking. Like, he's legitimately the oldest person in the Champions League behind Buffon. Uh, he may even be older than Buffon. It really wouldn't surprise me. Uh, let's actually check this out. Uh, you know what? I'll say 36 just to kind of keep myself in check. Uh, 32. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I didn't realize that. Well, the reason I'm reacting like this, I'm sure some of you are saying right now, yeah, 32 is pretty old, Rob. I'm 32. I just turned 32 in September. So, yeah, sorry. It just doesn't feel that old, I guess. He looks a lot older than he is, and he's been playing forever. Maybe that's the big point is that, like, basically he's been going since I was 12 years old, and so I just think he's 40. Uh, but, yeah, uh, fuck how isn't really... I guess, like, um, he doesn't have the floor. You wouldn't know it. He takes set pieces and penalty shots. Uh, free kicks, I should say, and penalty shots. But, yeah, um, just not a lot to look at in terms of Monaco. And, like, again, Atletico don't need to win. Dortmund, in comparison, need to win. Uh, they're behind Atletico. So, like, they want to take this result. Uh, and Monaco are just bad enough that they may literally fall on four goals without even trying. Like, literally within 20 minutes, Dortmund could be up 4 nothing, and it wouldn't even surprise me. Now, is that something I'm like, cash, let's do it in cash? No, no, no. This is a GPP script that probably won't follow through. But if Dortmund is up 4 nothing in 20 minutes, don't be like, oh, my God, who predicted this? Like, it's pretty probable. If I'm thinking of it as probable, it's probably pretty, pretty reliable. Um, so, yeah, uh... I can totally get behind a Berkey clean sheet chase with some Guerrero. Uh, Guerrero's actually been playing as a forward, which is awesome. Uh, and what was funny was DraftKings had him as a forward, though he's a defender. They 
moved him back to Fender as Dortmund started playing him as a forward. Uh, so now we get the opportunity here to catch a clean sheet from a forward. Jump on this. Get on this. Play. I can't guarantee is going to play. I can't guarantee he's going to play 90 minutes. But what I can guarantee is that uh, he's the only person on Dortmund who scored multiple goals all season uh, in a game. So uh, I should say Champions League. I want to say in their domestic, but that statistic was relevant fairly, I'll say two game weeks ago, which is like a month ago. Things could have changed since then. It really wouldn't surprise me. But uh, Guerrero's probably one of my favorite plays this slate. It's really hard to look away from him. And uh, with Roos out, uh, I'll have to confirm that. If Roos isn't playing, uh, you're probably going to want to jump on some pull second cash because I would imagine he would start taking over the set pieces. Um, and as you can see, uh, he didn't play over the weekend uh, so that he could get a full full, full slapping worth here. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I'm really into Pulisic. Uh, it's hard to look. See, like, again, they're, they're rare, fairly injured. So we should get some interesting value in terms of some, like, low floor plays out of the midfield. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think... Uh, Paco Alcer is also a really interesting option, um, especially if Roos is out. Uh, it, it basically points towards him getting tons and tons and tons of time. Uh, I'll, see, this is like, this is a huge, I don't want to say concern, frustration, not even, because I'm not really that frustrated. It's just, I know it's not right. I know Mario Goetze is like as good as Griezmann, uh, and it's just for whatever he's not playing very well this season. So, especially converting his poor play into DFS. Uh, so, yeah, it, it should happen eventually. Like, he's that good. It's just it definitely hasn't. So, yeah, I think uh, from Dortmund, the two places you really want to look is the defense, starting with Guerrero and Berkey. I think they made 5.2K against Monaco. Ooh, this, what am I missing? What is the problem here? Because, uh, by all means... This is like the keeper play of the slate. Like it's such a shoe in obvious play. It's too obvious. That's how obvious it is. So yeah, uh, I'll be starting off a lot of my cards like this right here. And going from there, probably a little bit of this too. Um, but uh, in terms of my favorite defensive stack of the slate is definitely Dortmund. Monaco just have nothing going for them. They've been getting absolutely brutalized in domestic and here uh like yeah good game thanks for showing up monaco thank you for uh i, I shouldn't say thank you uh Bru club bruges is thanking you for the free buy into uh the europa league which is hundreds of thousands of dollars into their bank account basically by default just by existing in the same group as you monaco thank you Thank you. So, yeah, that is uh, basically the take here. 4 nothing Dortmund. They're going to win by multiple goals. So if, if they, um, the only reason I see them not winning by multiple goals is if Atletico take a red card or two red cards or something like the craziest thing at by halftime and Dortmund go in and see that Atletico are faltering. And then Dortmund may just like go completely ham and try and take first place. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think they'll just fall onto this a lot. Probably two, three, nothing, uh, Dortmund, I think is a really solid play and definitely, uh, where I'll be starting my defensive stacks this slate. Next game on the slate, we have the, uh, you know what? This is the game of the year of, of, uh, Champions League group stages. This is the one, um, Napoli traveling to Liverpool. Uh, it's hard to say what's going to happen because a lot of this determines on halftime. Now, I know we talked about it with Spurs and Barcelona, uh, but I'm actually going to talk about these two games all in the same one because the group is just so jam-packed. The results aren't even team-relevant. They're relevant to the other game. Uh, so that's what really interests me about this this match these matchups here I should say so 
Let's just say for the sake of argument, PSG are at least tying this game, which forces Liverpool to win. At the very least, if PSG tie, Liverpool need to win to force a tiebreaker, uh, which they would probably eventually lose. Uh, so, yeah, um, let's just say PSV gets a result, which means Liverpool needs to win. So, basically, what we're looking at is Liverpool at home. And it doesn't matter who the opposition is. Liverpool at home can be the best team in the world when they want to be. And if come halftime, they see PSV's or PSV, PSG's either losing or drawing, they may go absolutely hand bone to get this. Uh, because unlike Napoli, Napoli's in the situation where if they're losing at halftime and they see that PSG's winning, they're going to have to go absolutely hand bone. Now, if you're wondering what I mean by hand bone, hand bone is my definition for a team that throws literally every piece of logic out the window and does everything possible for the win, not limited, but including throwing your center backs as your forwards, taking your center backs off for forwards, and in the final few minutes, using your keeper up the field. Uh, you'll notice this sometimes in different replays and videos. Type into YouTube, top keeper goals. Uh, a lot of times when teams are behind or needing a result, and it's tied or close, and they get a corner kick or a free kick or some sort of chance, guaranteed chance creation, in the opposition last quarter, uh, they throw the keeper up and hope the keeper gives them the extra man advantage for the goal. And it, while rare, it does happen. So, <laughs> while rare, things are going to happen this slate. And a lot of this has to do with halftime and what PSG is doing. Um, because, like, if they're winning, Napoli has to win. If they're losing, Liverpool has to win. Um, so, yeah, it's it's up in the air completely. Liverpool can't tie this game. Liverpool tie, they finish at 7, and PSG doesn't even need to win at that point. So, Liverpool need the win, where, comparatively, Spurs can tie this game, and they're absolutely fine, and just need Inter Milan to lose, or, uh, or excuse me, no, if Inter Milan tie as well, um, then Spurs will lose in tiebreaker. But in terms of... Um, yeah, it would, quickly going back to the tiebreaker I talked about, look how close this is. Like, this is a legitimate situation where if scores finish a certain way, uh, we could be looking at a tiebreaker that runs all the way down to cards. Uh, so yeah, very, very interesting there. But yeah, Liverpool can't tie this game. They need to win. So there's a ceiling here that's probably the truest of the entire slate outside of uh, Inter Milan, who also need that win. And they arguably have the better chance and ceiling to do so against PSV, where Liverpool are playing Napoli, which is not easy at all. Even at home, it's going to be a challenge. A lot of this has to do with ownership, though. And... This slate, it comes down to really like you can't own Neymar and Messi. At that point, you're you're five K or less the rest of the card. Like there's there's no way. And like if you go um two nine Ks like um Kane and uh Salah, you're below seven K the West the rest of the way, excuse me. Like no questions asked. You will not be able to afford a ten K guy without getting like stupid punty the rest of the way. So it, you have to be really careful with where you place your ownerships of slate. And what I think a lot of times will happen um, is that people won't be used to Champions League and they aren't used to the schedule dictating results rather than how good teams are. Where Atletico may be one of the biggest favorites of the slate, but they're not going to score more than two goals. Where Liverpool may be one of the lower favorites to higher underdogs of the slate, while at the same time, they're probably going to score three goals. They have to. They really have to. Because like not only do they have to win, they have to prepare themselves for a potential tiebreaker, uh, which will come down to goal differential. So Liverpool should really... It, it's tough, right, because of their ownership. But they really should be one of your top teams this slate, along with Inter Milan, uh, because of the, the true ceilings uh, for both formats, really. Um 
Now, Liverpool would probably focus a little bit more on cash uh, with Messi, but uh, GPP maybe Inter Milan for the ownership uh, because I think Liverpool is still going to be hugely owned. But this is the interesting one right here, um, PSG at Red Star. I know a lot of people will be looking at Liverpool and Napoli. I think Liverpool has basically got this in the bag, and it's theirs to lose. Napoli is not very good on the road, um, and they really haven't been that impressive this Champions League. Um, it's actually r fairly rare for a team to lead most of the group stages without having more than two wins. Uh, really rare. So, by all definition, Napoli haven't been dominating like they should. When you look at the group, it kind of explains things. But um, PSG, well, no, no, that's that's not, no, no. Red Star has just been bonkers at home. Just like indescribably absurdly bonkers to the point that like i i don't know what's going to happen today uh now my take is that when liverpool and napoli came to red star uh now okay let me rewind here a little bit if you are unfamiliar with red star red star is basically i don't want to offend anyone here okay i know the political tensions in the former yugoslavia can be very personal for some people whose lives were completely turned up upside down by that war so i'm not here looking to step on toes and pretend i know things i'm kind of not really i i was a political science student but i'm kind of talking out of my ass here right now because i don't have literally the information in front of me red star was basically the serbian national army team i'm sorry if that's factually incorrect or really pisses some people off but the fact of the matter is that the Red Star hooligan firm is widely known to be filled or was during the Yugoslavian War, excuse me, was filled with war criminals. So uh, that's just the way things were that definitely you can watch any modern day documentary or interview or um, anything to do with the modern Red Star fan base and they will feverently and in many cases downright refuse to speak to English journalism it's because I just showcased exactly why they won't do that. I'm literally the definition of why they won't do that uh, because too many English speakers like myself just um, paint them off the same brush. And while it's grossly unfair, I want to make sure people understand that that definitely isn't the situation now. But that is where their grassroots and beginnings came from, uh, from the Yugoslavian War, where their 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 ultra hooligan fan base was mainly paratroopers that create were later convicted for lots of war crimes. So, yeah, it's it's tough. It's a really touchy subject, but it is. I'm not gonna swear. I almost swore. Scary as, it's unbelievable. This stadium is like nothing else in the entire world. I highly recommend you jump on YouTube and type in walking out into Red Star Stadium. And they'll show you the walk that Arsenal had to take last year during the Europa League, which they did not win. Uh, and the walkout is like, yeah, it's, it is terrifying. Like, it's one thing to say people are professionals and they all have to deal with it. It's another thing to say that like you're a professional and you're fearing for your life just because like people are straight nuttered about this game in that country. And um, talk about passion. It's just off the walls. It's outside of Turkey. It's legitimately the scariest place to try and go and play a game. Uh, so this is what's been happening. Liverpool go and they struggle and everyone's like, oh my God, what happened? And it's because Serbia's scary napoli go and they they struggle liverpool lost like napoli go and they draw and people are like oh my god w this red star team is such a surprise red star isn't even that good it's it's literally this stadium is a terrifying nightmare to play in now i'm again i want to feverently apologize to anyone that i may have offended with all that it absolutely was not meant to be. Please take it as my Canadian nativity showing through and just not knowing enough about the world and talking crap like I do. So I apologize. But um, yeah, this game today could be really interesting because 
like I said, PSV, PSV, I keep saying PSV, PSG need this result just in case Liverpool win. Uh, a PSG result, whether a tie or a win, advances them. Because if PSV tie, they'll be tied with Napoli. And if Napoli win, they'll be ahead and Liverpool have lost and will stay behind. Or if Napoli ties, then Liverpool will tie and Liverpool won't get ahead and PSG will get through. Or Napoli loses, Liverpool wins, PSG ties and they have that three-way again. But PSG would finish first in the group with those tiebreakers, which is actually the, the more impressive thing. Um so, yeah, it all depends from there how far the tiebreakers go down. At certain points right now, Liverpool actually is the tiebreaker winner. But if we assume the situation where we would get to a tiebreaker, um, Napoli may actually end up... It's tough uh, because, yeah, um, it depends how many goals Napoli scores, if they if they score at all. Uh, if they get held off the score sheet, they're, they're done. Even with a tie, they're done. They're, they're going home uh, because the tiebreaker will completely crap them without an away goal. Napoli need an away goal today, which goes two ways. Firstly, one, you can take some Napoli players because you know that they're going to be going for it. They still do need to win, and they're going to need goals. And two, there's a serious Liverpool defensive aspect here that you can chase because you know, again, if Liverpool get ahead, uh, they're gonna Napoli are gonna go for it now. The last thing I want to touch here, really quickly in this group, um, when Liverpool and Napoli went to Red Star, they didn't need a victory. It was early in the group stages. They were both focused on incredibly important domestic league games. For example, take a look back at Liverpool, and this was in the middle of their Chelsea, Man City crazy run of fixtures, where it was just like, wow, who were they? Or PSG? Uh, these crazy run of fixtures were like they're in the middle. A tail end, excuse me, of the fixtures. And uh, so it wasn't really surprising that they had a bad result. And Napoli was like the first game of the Champions League. So again, not if you take last year into consideration, the first leg, first game last year, Man City lost at Shakhtar. So like those first games don't always carry over perfectly by the time the end of the tournament comes around. So yeah, um, the last thing I want to talk about is... Uh, the, uh, oh man, I forgot because I got so sidetracked there, obviously. Uh, this final group is just so crazy that it, it's just, there's so much to talk about. Now I remember, sorry, Napoli versus Liverpool. This is really, uh, the game to target this slate for two reasons. Uh, firstly, like I mentioned already, Napoli need to win. Liverpool need to win. Both teams need to score. Napoli need to score for the tiebreaker. Liverpool need to score just to, to get a result. But more importantly, and what I want to finish the video on, Napoli and Liverpool are two teams that are literally, literally, literally built to go up early in the game and have the second team, their opposition, be forced to win the game. And this is like, this game, literally today, is what Liverpool and Napoli are built for. Entirely. For the script, situation, moment of the season, moment of the group stage, literally. This couldn't define more about what these two teams are constructed to do, which is to perform in these types of games where a team gets ahead, the, them, they get ahead, and the opposition is forced to throw bodies forward and to uh, try and capitalize. These two teams love to counter, love to counter. And you don't have to be a genius to know that Liverpool is one of the best countering teams in the world right now with guys like Salah who can run the 100 meters in Olympic time and basically get from point A to point B in the flash of a, a blink of an eye, excuse me. And in the case that Liverpool get up early and Napoli know they need a goal, they need at least a goal to be relevant in the tiebreakers, they're going to throw everyone forward, including their defenders, including their keepers, including taking off their defenders four more forwards. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's tough to chase the Liverpool defense in the case that um, they get scored on and they're forced to go for it, and then Napoli is able to do the countering game and let them come. But, uh, yeah, that that's really the big thing here. This is going to be an insane game, like literally the game of the season because not only does it have crazy implications on the way your cards are built, the way the Champions League breaks down, but, like, whenever the analytical team back office people are sitting down and crunching the numbers and 
this is the moment. This, like, like I said at the start, there was no surprise. It's this Champions League. Whenever they sat down, this was like prerogative number one, program number one. This is this is what they think will happen, and this is what they build for. So enjoy it. If you're new to soccer or you haven't really got fully into it yet, this is this is the bee's knees today. This is the real deal. So yeah, um, I didn't again. I didn't really want to talk too much on players because. Comparing them to the slate is irrelevant. It really is. It doesn't matter how much they cost. Salah can cost 16k this slate, and you're still going to need exposure to him because he's in such fine form. Their team has such a true ceiling, and the game is literally scripted for him as a like as a counter-attacking style player to just crap everywhere, like just go ham, absolutely nutter. So yeah, um, I'm sorry for if you were looking for like, oh, but I think this person is too expensive. Hit me up on Twitter or uh, hit me up in the Roto Post Pro Slack, excuse me, if you have a question in terms of like the salaries in these games or the ownerships because um, I think Liverpool will draw a lot of ownership. So that is something to consider too. Uh, but yeah, I'll say, um, ooh, this is tough. Um, I don't even know what to say. Like, I'm totally like at odds with this game because it could go so many different ways. Like, I want to say it could go like four nothing either way if a team starts losing and they really have to win and they start losing even more. Uh, it could finish 1-1 if, like, they're both, like, super going for it and super focused on going for it and their defenses stand strong. Um, I think PSG is probably going to win to the tune of 4-1. Um, I think that's a little bit easier to call. I should have mentioned, like I did earlier, uh, Kylian Mbappe is absolutely like terrorizing the away uh away games so um yeah 12 uh 12 goals uh he has eight of them away uh in his career uh champions league so like he's a career away player um but yeah i, I i've been burned by cavani too many times to look at 8.3 and be like yeah let's let's do that even against red star so maybe that's everyone's Q to finally get on him. But uh, yeah, I'll say uh, 4-1 PSG, Mbappe with at least two goals, and Neymar with at least an assist, uh, probably a goal and an assist. I think Neymar and Messi are like one and two for cash for me. Like get them both in there if you can and just punt everywhere else. Uh, but 3-2 Liverpool. Let's, let's just go for it. Let's say another really high goal score. The difference being... Everyone in this game costs 10k, which uh, the inter game everyone costs 8k. Uh, so yeah, that that's really uh, my takes. Uh, I hope everyone liked the video. I'm going to attempt to upload this here. Hopefully it works fine, and uh, hopefully it turned out really well. Um, the video should be improving as well. Uh, it shouldn't be just like the one banger like you just saw. Uh, I'm going to start breaking it up and hopefully making this a little bit more time friendly because I'm pretty sure this just went over an hour and a half again like they always do. So yeah, thanks a lot everyone for tuning in. Rotopros.com. Uh get over, sign up, have a good time. Rad Rob Diamond on Twitter. Get over. Follow. Have a good time. It isn't really that good a time. Hit me up anywhere you just like. Thanks a lot everyone. Take care. Hopefully see you at the top today. Best of luck. Much love.